Recording starts now. Uh, right. So, um, uh, first of all, on the behalf of CSH, I would like to uh, apologize for this for this slight delay due to unforeseen technical uh, technical glitches. But now we are we are all set and um, and ready for for our fourteenth uh, uh, CSH seminar and lecture series. Um, so. I'd like to first of all um, uh, say good afternoon to or good morning to everyone. Um, my name is Jean-Thomas Martelly. I'm a researcher in political science here at the Centre de Sciences Humaines. Um, on the behalf of the CSH, it's my very great pleasure to welcome you for for this new new episode and uh, uh, almost the last one of the year, as there's. One more, uh, one more seminar coming in two weeks. Uh, as you all know by now, the CSH lecture and seminar series are covering a wide range of disciplinary foci, focusing on South Asia, um, and range uh, from development uh, studies to geography, including political science, sociology, anthropology, modern contemporary history, as well as economics, and a few disciplines that I, I, I might have omitted. In two weeks' time, we are uh, welcoming uh, Christophe Andres, um, who will be presenting his, uh, his new book titled Revolutions in Learning and Education from India, um, and where he will offer a critique um, of the ways in which mainstream education um, is, is practiced in India and perpetuates uh, uh, inequalities in the country. Um, but today, uh, um, we have the immense pleasure of um, having with us uh, Dr. Anna Rudok. Um, Dr. Anna Rudok is a medical anthropologist. Um, she holds her MA from the University of Oxford and a doctoral degree in anthropology from the King's India Institute, um, King's College London. Uh, Anna I was a global health policy advisor at the Wellcome Trust, and um, in a previous in a previous life, she was she was also um, research analyst for the, the Foreign Commonwealth Office uh, of the of the UK. Uh, she has been a, um, an active uh, personality uh, in, in in public sphere in various um, in various think tanks such as the Centre for welfare reform, raising awareness for um, neglected disease such as ME and chronic, fat, uh, which is the chronic fatigue syndrome. She's currently a global advisor for uh, research uptake and learning at Side Savers. Um, but today, today um, she will be presenting um, extracts and insight from her um, new book, um, to be published by a Stanford University Press called Special Treatment, Student Doctors at the Old India Institute of Medical Sciences. So we are quite we are quite privileged because if I understand well, this is one of the very first uh, 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 very first talk that Anna is giving ahead of this uh, ahead of this book. So we are really privileged to be the the the, the host of this informal book launch. Uh, uh, so it's always it's always quite uh, 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 quite exciting and stimulating to see this happening, um, especially for 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 young researchers like like some of us here. Um, so today, Anna will be discussing the training um, uh, the, the training process at the uh, at Ames, which, uh, as all of you know, is the All India Institute of Medical Science. Um, located in in New Delhi um, this uh, this uh, anthropological uh, account could not be more timely um, as you know uh, education and politics of uh, elite public care in India is central to understanding uh, what is and what has unfolded in the previous in the previous month in in India with the the second wave of the epidemic of of uh, COVID nineteen, and in which 
uh, thousands, in fact, hundreds of thousands of people struggled and often failed to access public or medical infrastructure, interacting with panicked, untrained, aloof, and exhausted medical uh, personnel. Um, as 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 Anna will be will be will be discussing, Ames is characteristic of a certain form of a uh, uh, public, Peruvian public elite in in India, as its acceptance rate uh, rate is uh, 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 less than zero point zero one percent, um, making Ames the the apex of Indian medical uh, education. Um, so, in particular. Uh, um, Anna will be will be asking what what happened when um, medicine is used not as a social equalizer but as a mean to cultivate and maintain prestige, which I think it's a burning it's a burning question not only for Ames but also in other in other disciplines and in other uh, public in fact private institutions also. So without further delay. I'm really, really, um, really extremely happy to to uh, uh, to give the the mic and the floor to to Anna. Um, uh, Dr. Anna Rudok will be speaking for uh, 40 to 45 minutes, and then we will open the floor to questions. Which, as uh, as we can foresee, there will be there will be quite many. Um, don't hesitate to uh, ask your question in the chat box, and I will I will relay I will relay those questions. Uh, of course, we have a we have a preference for live questions, so please stay till the the end, and then we will uh, um, ask you to unmute yourself and and or or raise your hand and and, and interact with Anna. So 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 Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you, JT, for the lovely introduction and for the invitation to speak to you all today. You're right, this is my very first talk actually about, about this new book. Um, so it's a, it's a treat to do it with you as, you as my host, with my old friend. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to Niru for all the logistics behind the scenes and to Clement, who is our tech wizard today and is, I'm very grateful, is gonna share my slides because i apologize the delay was entirely due to internet glitches in london and not in delhi um i also see some friends in the audience so hello to all of you and to everyone who i don't know it's a pleasure to meet you and thank you for taking the time to to come and listen to me today okay next slide please i'm going to turn my camera off while i speak just to preserve my bandwidth and then i'll put it back on when it comes to time for questions Okay, so to give you a just a quick overview of how I've structured this presentation, I'm going to be talking, I want to avoid a kind of plodding, here is chapter one, chapter two, etc. of this new book. So I've split the presentation into a discussion of what, why and how I've done this work. What, what have I done? Why have I done it? And how did I do it? And then I've pulled out some key themes and some highlights pertaining to each of those themes. And then I'll end with some reflections from this time of pandemic, because as JT says, it, this, the publication of this book, this was not planned. It happens to coincide with this moment of great emergency in, in Indian and indeed global public health. Next slide, please. So what is it, this book, Special Treatment? In, in sum, it's an anthropological study of MBBS students specifically and their experiences at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences or AIMS in Delhi. And I want to begin by noting that several branches of AIMS have been established in different North Indian cities in the last few years and there are more to come. For now, however, AIMS still connotes the original institution in Delhi and I refer to it as such throughout the book and throughout this presentation. So it's an anthropological study. It's the first study of AIMS using ethnographic methods. There was There is one significant study of AIMS by T.N. Mudden from back in the 80s um, when he looked at doctors practicing at AIMS um, and that was largely survey-based work. Um, 
And other than that, there's actually been very little. So this is the first attempt to give an ethnographic perspective on the institution. Um, and it also draws heavily on interviews and documentary sources. I collected my data. I did my fieldwork between January 2014 and May 2015, which is quite a long time ago now. And it feels like a long time ago. And in other ways, it doesn't feel long at all. Um, and the project began as my PhD, as JT said, at King's College London, and it was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council. And the book will be published next month in July 2021 by Stanford um, as part of the South Asia in Motion series. And perhaps we can mention at the end, JT, that if anybody is interested in, in reading the book, in purchasing it as an ebook or in hard copy, then I would really like to share a discount code with you so that you don't have to pay full price for it. Definitely, Anna. Let me paste the code in the in the chat box uh, while oh, while you're speaking, so that so that people have immediately access to it. Great, thank you. Why did I choose to do this work, this study of aims? Largely because of its place in the popular imagination, and I'm assuming familiarity with aims from this audience. So I'm not going to go into too much background about the institution. Um, but as a, as a reminder or a scene setter, these three key facts are those that really inform the life of the contemporary institution. So it was established in 1956. It was opened in 1956 as a post-colonial institution. But the, the period of planning and conception um, occurred over several decades. So it's a, it's a hybrid in a way. The planning began during the British colonial regime and it was finally brought to fruition by the government of independent India. Um, famously, AIMS sees an average of 10,000 outpatients a day. Um, and as JT mentioned, it has a notorious acceptance rate for the MBBS of less than 0.01%. Um, and this latter fact about the acceptance rate is, is what it, I would like you to bear in mind throughout the presentation. Um, and just to think of how the media covers this process and the profiling of the toppers that you see across the media at this time of, this time of year. Um, so it, it's a well-known, but a strangely understudied institution. Next slide, please. And I really like this, this quote from, from Didier Fassin from an article he wrote about public ethnography. Um, and I'll, I'll read this to you. It says, ethnography is particularly relevant in the understudied regions of society, but can be significant also in spaces saturated by consensual meanings. In the first case, it illuminates the unknown. In the second, it interrogates the obvious. Studying aims fulfills both of these criteria it's notably understudied and thus constitutes what Fassan calls a black hole of ethnography. And yet as a nationally renowned institution embedded in the public imagination, it is also a repository of unchallenged assumptions. And few of these assumptions have been addressed by social sciences. In work on treatment seeking, AIMS arises periodically as a feature in the healthcare landscape, often to emphasize the uneven scale and quality of provision. In these contexts, Ames is usually cast as a remote and exceptional site, mentioned only as an outlier among public hospitals. What I try to do through this book is to add some nuance to this portrayal by suggesting that Ames influences the broader landscape in both imagination and practice, and therefore by extension, the experiences of patients and trainee doctors who may never actually personally attend the institute, either the college or the hospital. And in considering this wider influence, I aim to make an implicit case for the validity and the import of studying institutions that appear at first glance to be disconnected from the broader context in which they exist. And this also links with, with the imperative in anthropology going back some decades now to study up um, to study the formation of power within institutions, as well as its effects on the people who are subject to it. And in this case, in other words, my argument is that we need to understand how doctors are trained 
in order to enhance our understanding of patient experiences of medicine as an often oppressive institution. Next slide, please. So during a conversation, during my fieldwork, during a conversation about where he planned to apply for postgraduate study, the student I refer to as Sushil in the book concluded by saying, but aims is aims. And I heard this on more than one occasion and it came to quite neatly encapsulate the work I was trying to do. Aims occupies a unique place in the popular Im imagination about medicine in India, in North India especially. It is widely considered to be the best, both in terms of medical expertise and education. But as I've said, little work exists that interrogates this assumption. So why did I do this work? I did it largely because I wanted to try to understand what it means that aims is aims. What does it mean to be the best? How do we understand excellence and what are its implications for medicine and healthcare? What influence does AIMS have over the wider landscape? And what is the association between medical education and social inequalities? And these are the questions that are at the heart of the book. And I attempt to offer partial answers to them through a few different lenses. Next slide, please. So before I move on to the key themes of the book and some examples of how I approach these questions, I want to say a few things about how I did the work, um, not only in terms of methods, but the wider experience of studying an elite institution and how my own identity and circumstances influenced this. This picture shows a, a red carpet that was definitely not rolled out for me, but it also nods to the fact that I did gain access thanks to the elite networks that I was already part of and the capital I possessed as a white British person from a London university. So briefly, and I have, I've written about this elsewhere um, in terms of the, I've written about the more Kafkaesque, slightly comedic elements of, of trying to get access to this institution. But more seriously, I do want to note the role of elite networks and capital in accessing elite institutions. Um, and I had connections through the Indian Institute at King's College London that connected me to the Ministry for Health and Family Welfare, which was critical to ensuring my access to the institution for research purposes. I had connections to alumni who are now in senior positions. Um, I was also fortunate early on to be connected with a person who became my key informant and, and champion, if you like, of this work. Um, and he was absolutely indispensable to um, supporting and ensuring my, my access um, for research purposes. Persistence, I, I do take some personal credit for persistence. I, uh, I did keep going and we did go around in, in many circles. Um, but even this is partly was partly due to having the luxury of time and funding to persist. You know, I think it the PhD is quite a unique period in that it does allow us to a bit more time and space um, to lay the groundwork for things, which when you're in an academic post and you're applying, you know, you're writing proposals, that kind of leeway is is very rarely present. So I fully acknowledge that. I was very fortunate to have the funding to spend time in Delhi and to, to keep going and keep knocking on the door. Methods and writing. So the heart of the book is informed by interviews, by ethnographic work and by secondary source analysis. I conducted semi-structured interviews with a total of 55 different actors, many of them on multiple occasions. Um, and these were predominantly current and former AIM students and faculty. The thread through the book is, is woven through the experiences of a core group of between 10 and 15 MBBS students who I got to know and spent time with in, in different settings during my research. Due to convenience and, and snowball sampling, most of these were fourth years and fifth years or interns. 
And while the book follows a, a roughly chronological structure from students getting in to graduating from Ames, what it lacks is the voices of first years, particularly. Um, it also lacks sufficient attention to gendered experience, although this is not entirely absent. Um, and both of these aspects are symptoms of this having been the PhD project of a rookie researcher and also the need to get started, keep going and work with, with what we find. Um, it's in the nature of anthropological work in particular to let the field reveal itself. Um, so as an example, I, I went to Delhi with very broad ideas of what I was interested in at Ames and the specific focus on MBBS students emerged in time. Um, and this, this does entail the luxury of time, it stems from the luxury of time, but it also indulges a degree of inexperience. Um, and were I to do this project again, I would be more purposive in my seeking of a range of informants that could speak to experience at different stages of the MBBS, as well as seeking to understand gendered experiences in more depth. Although intention doesn't necessarily mean that I would be more successful this time around. The other consequence of, of this approach, and I think particularly of making the first attempt of a study, of an ethnographic study of an institution like Ames, was my choice to go for breadth over depth when writing the PhD thesis, but particularly when converting it into a book. So each chapter of the book has a different theme. And had I chosen that approach, it could easily have been a book in itself if I'd wanted to have it as a singular focus. Instead, what I've done is, is write a first attempt at understanding Ames as a medical college through a variety of different lenses. And throughout the writing of the book, my main intended audience has been medical students. Um, at the heart of the book is a, is a message about the harm that can be done or the limitation of reducing medicine and medical education to positivist science. My argument for the inclusion of social science and humanities in medical curricula, and indeed in the school education of all aspiring health professionals, is I hope bolstered by the existence of the book itself as an example to students of how a social science lens can contribute to the envisaging of medicine as a humanist endeavor. I also conducted ethnographic work in certain clinics over several months. And while I conducted short interviews with patients around the AIMS site with the help of my research assistant, Preeti, I saw very quickly that deeper engagement with patients in a setting as crowded and as overwhelming as AIMS was not going to be possible. And this also contributed to my growing focus on students. And finally, on, on methods, I, I've mentioned that being white British from an elite London university no doubt bolstered my efforts to gain research access to AIMS. I'm also a disabled woman. I have a dynamic fluctuating chronic illness that involves extreme fatigue or energy impairment, pain and cognitive impairment. It impacts how I live and how I work and necessarily how I con conducted this research, for which Preeti, my research assistant, was, was indispensable. Anthropology prides itself on long-term fieldwork as its methodological hallmark. For a long time, this has been accompanied by a narrative, sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit, of endurance and physical exertion. And while the discipline has become more reflexive over time, and we have valuable critical perspectives on the influence of gender, race and sexuality on anthropological practice, the discipline has been slow to be inclusive of disabled practitioners. I say more about this in the book, and I'm very happy to discuss it further. But for now, I raise it to note another way in which my identity influenced my work. And ultimately, I hope as a contribution toward making the world safer for difference among anthropology's practitioners, as well as among its subjects. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, rather than taking you on a plodding tour of the book chapter by chapter, I've chosen instead to pull out a few key themes and share some examples of how I address them. So we have four here on, on this slide, elite institutions and higher education, caste and affirmative action, excellence and super specialised medicine, and medical education and inequalities. 
there are others, of course. Um, sorry, Clement, can we just go back one second? Thanks. There are others, but these are the headlines. Um, and I, I want to share some highlights with you that are relevant to each theme. I'm not going to go into great detail, but do please feel free to feel free to bring up anything of interest um, and we can we can discuss it at, at the end. I'll elaborate as, as best I can. Next slide, please. So elite institutions and higher education. It's important to understand the complexity of of the AIMS mandate. Um, AIMS was conceived in the final years of the British colonial regime, as I said, but brought to fruition by the government of newly independent India. The mandate for the Institute was ambitious and reflective of a moment in which post-colonial ethos of scientific development was not supported by attention to grassroots health infrastructure. AIMS was modeled in part on Johns Hopkins in the US and tasked with becoming India's premier medical institution, combining the finest research and medical facilities with high quality training of new generations of Indian doctors. It was intended to set a new standard. It was created to be the best. It was also intended to apply social medicine to the nation's myriad health challenges, many of which were and continue to be entangled with poverty and social exclusion, this complex mission ensured that AIMS was immediately implicated in tensions between the techno-scientific emphases of development and the wider social determinants of health, while having to manage the consequences of a lacklustre policy approach to public health care beyond urban hospitals, and the conflict inherent in tasking a consciously elite institution with playing a part in remedying inequality. As I show in the book, these complexities endure Arguably, they've become more complex over time. And they're made visible in some ways through the experiences of MBBS students and in the image of the doctor that students are trained to become. So JT alluded to this in the introduction. You know, this, this book is, it is about AIMS and there are large parts of it that are very specific to medical education. Um, but there's also a lot of material that is no doubt applicable to other institutions of higher education. Um, the most obvious comparison is the IITs, given a, a similar history and a kind of equivalence of prestige in a sense. Um, but I think there, are, there is relevance to higher education in general, and there's also relevance beyond India. Um, not everything in the, that I write about is unique to to India's particular challenges when it comes to higher education or thinking about who and what is it for. Other dimensions of this theme include the middle class nature of the institution and the type of capital that a young person must possess to even consider applying to AIMS, given the necessity, other than in exceptional cases, of decent schooling, of coaching and of a certain standard of English. This also applies to students from scheduled caste and scheduled tribe communities and the students who have the most difficult time at AIMS with occasionally tragic consequences that we read about are often those who fall outside of this middle class milieu and all of that implies. This point I have on this slide where it says coasters in, in inverted commas during a discussion, um, a student referred to fellow students with reserved seats as coasters, implying that they, they had an easy time, that they could coast and didn't have to make the same effort to do as well as students in the general category. In the book, I suggest that if the moniker coaster is applicable to anyone, it is to the institution itself. The institution's reputation is sustained by enormous demand and an admissions process measures little beyond an aptitude for test taking, which allows the institution to minimize pedagogical in innovation and pastoral efforts and extra institutional or extracurricular support that, that some students do need. And this leads us on to broader reflections about public institutions and social responsibility and the purpose of higher education. Um, which is obviously a much a much larger conversation, um, and I will briefly return to this in in my reflections at the end of the the presentation. Next slide, please. 
passed an affirmative action. Many of the, the students I interacted with at Ames used a discourse of, of freedom, in inverted commas, to characterise their time at Ames. The precise nature and extent of this freedom, however, depended on particular aspects of students' experience, and not least whether their place at Ames was one of those reserved for students from other backwards classes, scheduled castes and scheduled tribe communities. I did not, as it were, go looking for caste at Ames, yet without denying the analytical salience of other intersectional determinants of student experience, class in particular, as I've already mentioned. The simultaneous centrality and obfuscation of affirmative action on campus, this kind of semi-spectral presence of reservation-based difference, made its scrutiny feel particularly urgent. The politics of affirmative action counter any idealized vision of aims as an institution transcending oppressive social structures in the pursuit of a universal humanist medicine. The lives of students are permeated by the consequences of structural inequalities, both in the clinic and on campus. Therefore, the institute and, and medicine itself is not set apart from, but is emblematic of the social unease that is characteristic of modern India. Ames has a, a dark history of, of caste discrimination. Um, during the, the protests in 2006 against the reservation for OBCs, Ames led um, a hunger strike. It, it led a hunger strike on behalf of the medical, medical community. It was, it was at the heart of that. Um, and many of you who were in Delhi at the time will probably remember that it became known as Kranti Chalk or Revolution Square. Um, and the Thorat report that came out into caste discrimination at Ames during that period detailed many instances of severe bullying in hostels, pressures on students and faculty to strike, and the refusals of faculty to teach even when asked during the, during the strike. I found caste discrimination to be more spectral at Ames these days. Um, but it is inevitably present, of course it is, and it is most tragically illuminated by the periodic suicides of young students in the shadow of this very famous public hospital. Um, and it's also worth saying that during my time at Ames, um, discrimination within and toward faculty was more overt, shall we say, than it was among students at that point. The point that caste is rendered visible for those with reserved seats in a way that it is not for those in the general category points to, to work on the sociology of the general category. The fact that it is seen to espouse this mer meritorious casteless norm um, populated by upper castes. And the I encountered um, an indignance among students in the general category, among upper caste students, about being forced to confront caste, particularly those from elite schools that taught them, you know, that a casteless worldview is a progressive worldview um, that denies attention to the structural oppression of caste um, and is a mindset that is almost entirely specific to upper castes. And this all links to work on, on merit that various scholars have, have done excellent work on. And I draw in particular on work by Satish Deshpande um, on entrance exams in particular, and Ajanta Subramanian's excellent work on, on caste and, and merit um, at IIT Madras, which I recommend to you if you're interested in this area. Um, in... In the chapter of the book that, that deals with this, I, I have an analysis of one year's MBBS exam, entrance exam results. And the MBBS entrance exam results are calculated to seven decimal places. So it, it becomes an empirical absurdity, really. Um, Tiebreakers are, are used in order to enforce some kind of difference between what are essentially the same scores. 
And I show how you have to go through thousands and thousands of results across cast categories, across, across res reserved categories, before you see any real divergence. And I link this to some of the work that Deshpande has done on rank, um, showing that rank is a means to create heterogeneity where there is actually homogeneity. Um, I also show through discussions with, with some faculty as well as students that rank is often used to, to justify a perception of a capability difference. Um, but often this is due to, particularly due to difficulties with English. Um, it's not due to any kind of difference in terms of entrance exam or capability when it comes to multiple choice questions about physics, chemistry and biology. Um, this is where the, the class milieu point comes in and the privilege that students do or don't arrive at aims already in possession of. Um, the freedom that aims supposedly offers students suggests conversely that, that a high degree of self-direction and institutional navigation is required to extract the greatest benefit from the MBBS. Not all students arrive equipped with the resources this demands. For some whose childhoods have not afforded them the necessarily privileges, freedom has a darker side that can lead to tragic outcomes. And so I found and I argue that the politics and experience of affirmative action demonstrate both the possibility and the frailty of AIMS as a, as a liminal space, as this in-between space where students are in the process of being turned into doctors, becoming something new. And I also introduce a concept of a biographical number, which I use to explore the influence of exam ranking on students' perceptions of themselves and their, their future prospects. And I look at how enduring the, this number can be in terms of what a student is taught to expect of themselves and where they can go, depending on, on where they were ranked. Um, in addition to linking to the, this huge number of applicants and the, the challenge of differentiating, I also make a point that the, the inability of institutions to absorb the demand is, is also what fuels resentment and casteism, um, and that this serves certain agendas and it disguises infrastructural and policy shortcomings. And thinking more specifically about medicine, I look at how different narratives are used to disguise casteism. Um, for example, in 2006, the organization of medical college students from across medical colleges in Delhi known as Youth for Equality, could claim that reservations were not only a violation of equality motivated by vote bank politics, but also by undermining efficiency, in quotes, they posed a threat to India's national development and its burgeoning status as a global superpower. And we're all familiar with this narrative. This theme surfaced in my conversations with students at Ames. And in the book, I discuss how encoding caste in a discourse about medicine as a moral endeavor not only revealed feelings about who warrants the status of an Amesonian or an Ames graduate, it also disguised within a purported concern for life and death, opinions about who should and who should not be permitted to become a doctor at all. By invoking a doctor's responsibility for human lives, one student introduced an emotive discourse of moral panic that rendered medicine as an ethical domain that must be protected from infiltration by people without merit. Not because, not explicitly because they threaten the supremacy of upper castes in this narrative, but because they oppose a literal threat to life. This is not about the interests of individuals or worse still, politics, this upper caste narrative insists. It is about humanity itself. Next slide, please. Excellence and super specialized medicine. So this is where the, the book is, the relevance of the book is specific to medical education. And it matters that what we're talking about is, is AIMS and, and not another institute of higher education. So throughout the book, I build on work by Henrietta Moore and Nicholas Long about achievement as a social event 
um, which involves different people and which has consequences for how an individual thinks of herself and how she relates to those around her. And I link this to the status that comes with being part of a very exclusive club of AIMS MBBS students and also the pressure and expectation that entails. And I look specifically at the drive to super specialise in medicine. So the conventional wisdom, and I have quite a long chapter on this, um, and actually if I were to recommend any chapter to you, it would, it would be this one, I think. The conventional wisdom is now that super specialising is necessary in order to be a success as a doctor. And students support this with a narrative of, of patient demand for specialised treatment. They, as they see it, no patient wants to go to a local doctor, an MBBS doctor, a family doctor. They, everybody wants to go straight to a specialist. And this is, of course, informed by the social milieu in which these students come from and also the institution at which they are trained, which is officially supposed to be a tertiary specialist institute. However, it compensates by providing all levels of care, given the absence elsewhere. And I base quite a lot of the discussion around this powerful quote from a former director of AIMS who told me during a conversation that AIMS killed the GP. And I use this to look at the role of AIMS in the, the devaluation of general medicine um, and the, the irony inherent in this when so many people end up at AIMS for want of accessible, affordable, competent general medicine. And yet the institution generally places more value on passing the US MLE, which is the exam that students need to take in order to pursue postgraduate training in the US, than they do to anyone aspiring to work in general or family or community medicine. A, a very senior member of the faculty said to me, we need good role models and we don't have them. And then of course the question becomes who should be responsible for establishing these models? Um, who, who is responsible for establishing a model which considers a gifted general practitioner as, as emblematic of excellence as, as a super specialised surgeon um, and which also sees that as a, a success for AIMS that AIMS has produced people who have gone on to transform general practice as well as to be these superstar surgeons. Waste and difficulty refers to student perceptions of medical practice beyond the city. In inadequate infrastructure was inevitably seen as an impediment, no surprise there. More interestingly though, for some students, there was a more complex understanding about rural medicine, or perhaps a lack of understanding about rural medicine, embedded in the frustration about absent technology. There was a feeling that this was not the sort of medicine an Amesonian was meant to practice because it was insufficiently complicated. It was not only a lack of equipment that discouraged students then, it was the perception of rural illnesses that this absent infrastructure reinforced, a lack of sufficiently complex conditions to do justice to the superiority of an Amesonian's training. And herein lies the paradox and the power of the Ames brand. I write in the book that the complex unfolding consequences of achievement and its associated ideas about value and legitimacy become apparent when we place this perception of the insufficient challenge of rural healthcare alongside the testimony of students who consider themselves unequipped to practice medicine of any kind after the MBBS. No one felt ready to practice medicine. At the same time, they felt overqualified to practice rural medicine. And the, one of the reasons that they don't feel equipped to practice medicine is that the vast majority spend the fifth year or the intern year when they are ideally supposed to be gaining clinical experience. That year is spent cramming for the postgraduate entrance exams in order to specialise. 
and I end this this chapter with with two stories um, of two upper caste young women who were really struck by their experience um, during the community medicine module and their time in Balabka where students go on a rotation. Um, it was once a rural health centre. It's now really a peri-urban health centre in, in Haryana. And these two young women were very struck by the, the potential of, of public or community health. Um, one of them decided that actually she wanted to go into the civil services and try and have some influence over medical curricula and training. And the other decided that she was really taken with public health and, and that's what she wanted to pursue. And I tell their stories how over several months these plans got curtailed and these futures were precluded by predominantly the expectations of their, of their families. The, the young woman who wanted to go into public health was told by her mother that anyone she had ever met with a, an MPH or a Masters of Public Health was an idiot, which neatly summed things up, I think. And by the time I left Delhi, they were both planning to go to the US for postgraduate training. And I take those stories of course, these are young women who have the, the privilege and the capital to allow them to go to the US for postgraduate training. But I also use them examples of, you know, we hear lots of stories of young people graduating from Ames, graduating from IITs and leaving India. And it's quite a singular narrative. Um, and I use these stories to, to illustrate the fact that that's not always what everybody wants to do. There are, there are other forces at play that are that channel young people into particular paths, particular predetermined paths often. And I conclude by I think reminding, well, reminding the reader, but also reminding myself as I was writing this, that MBBS students are 18 years old and occasionally 17 years old when they enter Ames. They have often committed years, years of their lives to winning entrance to this elite club without knowing or being asked really if and why they want to study medicine. It's very easy to forget how young they are, just as it's easy to forget that part of the All India Institute's founding purpose was to train teaching doctors who would work across the country in response to the needs of the country's poor. These details get obscured at an institution overwhelmed by demand. I'm primarily concerned with upholding a reputation for excellence defined as ever greater medical specialization. In the process, opportunities are lost to promote undergraduate medical education as an endeavor concerned as much with citizenship and individual potential as with the pursuit of predetermined socially sanctioned ambition. Next slide, please. Medical education and inequalities. So AIMS patients are, interestingly, there's a dual narrative that goes on in response to the enormous number of patients at AIMS, I found. Um, the, the common unexpected, well, the expected narrative that is very common is that so many patients obviously make life challenging and ha that has implications for work in the clinic, for communication, etc. Another narrative among students is that AIMS patients are an educational asset precisely because of their numbers and their clinical diversity. And what's interesting about that to me is that it means that essentially the value of an AIMS MBBS is produced, at least in part, by patients who do not have access to the type of healthcare environment in which an Amesonian is ultimately expected to practice. And I use this phrase patient labour um, to describe the way in which this, this informs the exceptionalism of medical education at AIMS. And, and within this exceptionalism is encoded uh, an urban, a highly technological and a thoroughly modern medicine. Simultaneously, as I've said, the overwhelming number of patients and their marginalised status is often used to excuse poor communication. Communication and the analysis of power relations in the clinic 
were not part of the curriculum at the time of my research. The MBBS admissions process was based on multiple choice questions about biology, chemistry and physics, and it builds on a school system that segregates sciences and arts as incompatible, and as such the exam entails no social science or humanities component, and no expectation that students will have thought about the human interaction at the heart of medicine, and no opportunity for students to articulate their motivation for becoming a doctor, which many students are perfectly able to do. By extension, the study of human interaction in the clinic and the social life of medicine it reflects is not part of, of the curriculum. Students are not given the opportunity to reflect on doctors as social actors with their own values and interests who are imbued with enormous power over human beings who seek their help. At Ames, that fundamental power differential is made all the more striking by the gulf between the everyday reality of middle-class cl clinicians at an elite institution and the poverty and marginalisation of many of their patients. Other than a cursory glance during the well-intentioned community medicine model, module, the structures that maintain and reproduce social inequality and, it, and their impact on health are paid little attention during the education of students who are told that they are the country's most promising young doctors. And so given, given the absence from the MBBS curriculum, Students learn about interaction with patients through either implicit example or overt instruction by individual faculty members. And learning in this manner entails a, sub a subtext about why certain styles of communication are deemed appropriate to certain patients and not others, and by extension what it means to be a good or a bad patient. It also reveals without addressing each doctor's own location in the social world of the clinic and the values they hold. This is the, an example of the workings of a hidden curriculum, that which the school teaches without in general intending or being aware that it is taught. One consequence of such absences is the conclusion by students that particular issues are not sufficiently important to warrant direct attention or are somehow unrelated to the practice and experience of health and medicine. And I spend some time in the book making an argument for the inclusion of humanities and social science in, in medical curricula. And this is by no means a new argument. Um, and I draw on the work of Arthur, Arthur Kleinman and others in, in the US. Um, and what's interesting is that actually in, in the original AIMS Act, yes, I'm nearly there, JT. In the original uh, AIMS Act, there is provision for the inclusion of humanities in the curriculum, but it has never been introduced. Integrating humanities, I suggest, would create space for interrogating rather than naturalising social inequalities and for self-reflection among students about the role of, doctor in, of the doctor in society. Integrating the humanities into medical curricula as a means of confronting social inequality is not about tasking young doctors with finding a remedy. It is about opening spaces for new and different ways of paying attention to themselves and the world around them. And I also make a point that within health systems research, we need to include much more attention to medical education. We need to look at the formation of medical power and authority um, and its influence on and within health systems. AIMS itself, by reimagining medical education, could promote the potential of higher education to inspire and foster social change, earning in the process, his reputation for excellence. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. So to conclude, just a few minutes, JT, and then I'm there. It has, as we said at the beginning, it's taken a while for this book to appear in the world, um, as, as is often the case. I think as students, we sometimes wonder why it takes so long for a book to appear in the world based on academic research. And then we try and write one and we realize why, quite why it takes so long. In the intervening years since my research at AIM, some things have inevitably changed. Um, a modernization project has resulted in upgraded branding and clearer signage around the hospital. There are more waiting areas. There's a digital appointment system, although I'm not entirely sure how that's going. The visibility of public health care on the political agenda has increased slightly, um, albeit mostly through a combination of insurance schemes and 
tertiary specialised hospital development and of course the expansion of the AIMS network. There are plans afoot, as I'm told, at AIMS to revisit the MBBS curriculum. Um, and in the wake of a revealing new annual survey of patients, the AIMS administration has said that it intends to pay more attention to inculcating communication and in a telling phrase, soft skills in its doctors. At a national scale, there are examples of things having taken a darker turn with the exploitation and violent exacerbation of social inequalities. And as I wrote the final words of this book, as it, as it happened, the, these divisions were being and continue to be both illuminated and entrenched by a pandemic that has overwhelmed the world. The COVID-19 outbreak has shed an unignorable light on how everyday structural oppression determines who suffers the most during a health emergency. This is true everywhere. But for India, this demands an overdue reckoning with the real meaning of public health and a legacy of political neglect. And this does not, should not, cannot stop at a diagnosis of inadequate infrastructure that cannot cope with the complexity of a pandemic. Rather, it asks for a confrontation with the reality that inequality in India is sustained in part by the absence of an association of public with a sense of interdependent citizenship. The novel coronavirus has demanded recognition of a biological interdependence of bodies that affluent social groups cannot easily consume their way out, their way out of. Not as easily as they often do. As yet, there is no device to filter the viral threat from household air as there is to cleanse it of polluting particulate matter. The pandemic is obviously not a social leveller of risk and vulnerability, however. It is confirming what we already knew namely that health emergencies exacerbate existing inequality. But it remains the case that in this unprecedented moment in the life of modern India and indeed the world, the privileged can no longer choose to believe that the health of the poor has little to do with them. Political leaders can no longer hide from the extent to which India's myriad social inequalities impact the health of its entire population. This reckoning with the implications for public health of public health comes as the weave of any remaining shared social fabric is being concertedly unpicked. Before the pandemic was even a rumour, some of India's most marginalised communities were already reeling from a surge in targeted violence. And we know all about this. We know about suicides. We know about violence against women and girls. India exists in a permanent state of public health emergency. The pandemic has simply brought it to the attention of people who have previously had little incentive to notice. So what does such a moment ask for from medical education in general and from an institution mandated to set national standards in particular? Not least, I suggest, an interrogation of prevailing conceptions of excellence and the role of the doctor in society that is imparted to students through both implicit suggestion and explicit example. A single institution cannot be expected to change the medical culture of an entire country, even an institution mandated to do just that. But it can use its privileged position to show the way. At present, the production and reaffirmation of narrow norms and conceptions of excellent aims acts to stifle the potential of the MBBS programme and its students and with it the transformative impact they could eventually have on Indian health and medicine. A re-envisaging of the purpose of undergraduate education at AIMS has the potential to make graduating from the country's most prestigious medical college more meaningful for all concerned. In the process, it could also make for an institution as exceptional in practice as it is in the imagination. Next slide, please. Thank you for listening. I really appreciate it. Um, here are my contact details. Uh, I think JT has put the, the link to the discount code in the chat. Thanks, JT. Um, the book is published next July, and I do hope that in due course there will be an Indian edition, which will make it far more accessible for those who I'm particularly would particularly like to read it. Um, thanks again for having me and looking forward to your questions. Thank you, Anna, for all your uh, uh, profound insights and your your 
uh, your impressions also and your, I'm sure, enduring findings, if not, since you, you reflected on this on this notion of endurance. I'm sure that um, we will have a lot of questions from from the audience. Um, I will interpret uh, uh, raise hands and raise thumbs as uh, aspirations for questions. Uh, I think that, for instance, Harsh Kapoor has uh, 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 raised his yes. raise his hand. Uh, yes, Harsh, would you like to would you like to step in? Uh, yes, uh, Anna, this is absolutely terrific and fantastic. The 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 the, the intervention that you made. Uh, I say this also with great excitement because I uh, grew up in immediate vicinity of Ames in the 1970s. And uh, uh, I also had uh, a privileged access to the Institute in the sense that my immediate maternal uncle was the director of the Institute. And I think uh, I have a, a, a sense that some of your work and notably the kind of specialization, focus on specialization that Ames has. I don't know whether this focus was the focus in the 70s and the 80s. I have a feeling that what you're saying about what happened to medical education and the killing of the GP can be said about engineering education as well, whereas the that specialization killed a lot of, uh, 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 you know, availability of doctors in the country for, uh, for use in medical education, training, and uh, also just availability as doctors. They went on to do this specialized stuff. I just want to react to two things. Uh, one is, uh, you, you hint, you said you have a, this chapter on specialization immediately followed by a chapter on, uh, I, I forget the name of the chapter, but it's, uh, you, you talk about the hidden curriculum. I think this hidden curriculum thing can also be said in a way with regards to a range of other professions. How does somebody become a teacher in India whether in the school or in the university. There is absolutely zero experience for teachers when they are suddenly just to have a PhD degree uh, and they, they're asked to go and teach. And they have very low social skills and abilities and so on, yeah? And they just have to struggle with this. And so there is very little written about this uh, because curriculums really emphasize on subjects of different kinds and so the social interaction and pedagogical skills are simply not uh, there as part of teaching and so on. And the third thing is this thing that you mentioned with regards to the absence of social science teaching and the need for it uh, within uh, medical education. Uh, the AIMS Act has room for it and many scientists and planners in India uh, who were planning engineering education and, and science education generally were also interested very much in this broader opening of horizons. You know, Nehru wanted a science museum in every village in India and so on. So there was this kind of idea of a scientific temper and scientists, scientific institutions also having some kind of I do remember personally, I can tell you, this was not part of uh, the curriculum, yes, but as part of social life, since you've done ethnography on the campus, uh, social life in the 70s on the campus meant that there were film societies, so people saw films of Tarkovsky and Alain René, and, and uh, at the same time, they also saw uh, there would be uh, science education, music education, and so on. There was societies on the campus uh, where uh, this kind of external, uh, through external invitation, people were invited to open horizons of students and teachers and so on. Okay, that's all. Thanks so much, Harsh. 
I wish I could have uh, makes me want to have a chat with you, hear the stories from your from your childhood and from your uncle. Um, thanks very much for for those three points. I will attempt to respond concisely to to each of them, but I'm very happy to carry on a, a conversation at another time. In terms of specialization being a more recent thing, yes and no. Um, based based on my on my research, that that quote I have about Ames killed the GP is part of a, a bigger conversation about this and the fact that Ames two things. One, I was interested in how when did Ames begin to compensate for the lack of primary care? Um, and the answer to that was from day one. And you can see from the figures in terms of outpatients, particularly if we compare with TN Mudham's book, that it was very, very busy, very, very quickly. And yes, that would have been the case for any hospital in India, but particularly one that is providing more than the tertiary care it was set up to provide. Um, and the, the debate and the dilemma around whether or not the emphasis should be on specialization, whether or not it should be more general does go right back to the beginning. Um, and there, there's some interesting writings in, in a couple of memoirs and, and different documents about, about that tension in terms of what, what should AIMS be. Um, and one of the questions I do sometimes get is why did you focus on MBBS students when AIMS was set up to be a specialist institution? And my answer to that is because it was also set up to train MBBS students. And what was the intention there then? Um, and also because MBBS students are at the most formative stage um, in terms of their, their thinking, their, their evolving in terms of what they might want to become. On the hidden curriculum, absolutely. I mean, my answer is I, I agree with you. It applies to, I mean, you could say it applies to everything, but to any, any profession that involves some kind of social interaction there will be things about the way in which you are trained that either imply certain ways of being or just don't address certain ways of being or do a combination of both. And there is also this concept of the null curriculum, which is the idea that there are some areas of social life that are not addressed at all, either through implication or explicit practice. Um, so I agree with you. And we could say that, you know, there's a hidden curriculum going on all the time. And in terms of the social science interest, yeah, it's so interesting and I'd love to do some more work on this. And you're absolutely, I do have a chapter on, on the history and the fact that it was Nehru and it was also, it was very much Raj Kumari Amrit Kaur's project. And, you know, they put together these teams um, who went off around the world to do these fact finding missions and intelligence gathering and they went to different medical institutions and colleges. You know, they went to the US, they went to the UK, uh, at Oxford in particular, there's a record um, from CG Pundit, who was part of one of those missions about the conversations they had about this innovation around social medicine and including humanities and different ways of teaching. So absolutely agree with you that the, the interest was there. Um, and we can see that by the fact that it was incorporated into the AIMS Act. And on the extracurricular stuff that's going on, still the case. Um, very, my point is not at all that there is no social science or humanities in these students' lives. They're, you know, they're smart people. They're very capable of pursuing their own interests. And a lot of them do. And a lot of them do have their own extracurricular kind of educations going on, particularly around the politics of health, some of them. Um, the point is, is to say, given that that's happening and look at the potential of these young people, what potential there is to, to make that more part of an explicit formal curriculum and ensure that, that everyone has access to that and everyone is provoked to think a little bit more widely and a little bit more critically about the endeavour of, of medicine. But thank you for the comments. Danish, you, you, you raise your hand. Would you like to would you like to ask your question to, to Anna? 
Oh, uh, sure, John. Thanks very much. Um, and it's quite a fascinating talk. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, so I come myself as a doctor and as a public health practitioner now, having worked in India and health systems for the last 10, 10 years. And I'm curious to understand from your own experience um, especially being in the UK, whether you see some parallels with other elite institutions such as Oxford and your own institution, and whether being an elite institution in some sense does drive social inequities and inequalities. Um, so what I'm trying to get at is, yes, AIMS and medical education in some sense has perpetuated inequalities, but that also has to do with when an institution does claim to be a center of excellence or aspires to be one, by its very nature, it does exclude a broad minority, a broad majority of students. So I'd be curious to know how that theme initially emerged as an area of exploration for you um, and linked to it if, I, if you have time and if I'm allowed to ask one more quick question. That's your own interaction with the students in the fourth and the fifth year of um, of medical education at AIMS, were they able to develop some additional gains or were they having additional social networks that perhaps came exclusively um, to them at being at AIMS? So what were some of the advantages that you found that students were talking about that they could appreciate that they got exclusively because they were at AIMS? Thank you. Thanks, Anish. Really, really good questions. Um, I think the two two parts to your first question. One is about the the inevitability of the production or the reaffirmation of inequalities, the very existence of an elite education of an elite institution, and yes, of course. Um, I think this is where and an absolutely applicable beyond beyond aims. Um, I think what's what's useful about studies of specific institutions is that they have we can look at the implications for particular areas of life or work. Um, but the a lot of the core um, the core discussion or the key themes are are translatable across institutions and, and certainly across countries because I think increasingly there is more of a shared culture between elites often than, than there is amongst domestic populations with very different experiences. Um, in terms of how, how that theme emerged for me, <laughs> it's a good question. You're asking me to, to think back. As I recall, I recall being very struck when I had conversations about students about what they wanted to do next. And it emerged very naturally that it was an absolute no brainer that that you had to you had to specialize at the very at the very minimum. So I was immediately interested in in this um, this this sense that without specialization, one one cannot survive as a as a doctor. Um, and what survival means, and I do write about this, this kind of flexible definition of, of survival um, for, different, for different people. Um, so I think, yeah, it came from, my interest in it came from the students and in this, this constant ever-present tension between the people you see at AIMS, the the way in which AIMS and similar tertiary institutions are constantly having to compensate in many ways for inadequate healthcare infrastructure. The tension between that and what these students feel that they absolutely have to go on and do in order to do justice to their, to their training. Um, and that continues to, to interest me. Um, and the point I think is about this, it comes back to this conception of excellence and how we understand excellence and whether or not there is potential to reconfigure some ideas of excellence. And I think there are parallels with institutions elsewhere, including my own. Um, I wonder if there are also examples in some of these institutions or these in universities that perhaps are more multidisciplinary 
where there is a bit more room for different definitions of excellence. Um, having said that, in the UK, I mean, speaking from my own context, we're seeing an ever greater move towards the narrowing of the purpose of higher education and the defunding of humanities and of social sciences and the narrowing of this instrumentalist approach and an excellence, you know, becomes about technical expertise and we're kind of back where we started. So it's um it's a it's a big area and continues to be thought provoking. Um fourth and fifth years, in terms of what they had access to as a result of being at Ames, it's a really good point because I don't think I can confidently tell you what they had access to through being at Ames compared to what many of them already had access to. So a lot of the students at Ames are from medical families already um, have access to funding for these fellowships in the US that they're not really supposed to do, but Ames turns a blind eye so long as they fund it themselves. Um, what the the students who, the, the less privileged students, what they spoke about in terms of what they appreciated was access to the faculty at Ames, access to conferences, access to these networks on campus, access to potential futures that they perhaps hadn't envisaged for themselves before. And on the whole, it was those students who were much more appreciative of the education they got at Ames than the ones who arrived with a lot more privilege up front, shall we say. I know we're running out of time, JT, so I'll stop talking. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Nicole Gravel, the director of, uh, of, of CSH, uh, has raised his hand, so I'm sure he has a, he has a question for you. Yeah, well, thank you very much for this really nice start. I mean, yeah, I found it very, very interesting. So it seems to be an interesting work. I'll try to read it, I mean, if I can. But I was just a bit intrigued with, by the what you said about this, because indeed from a, you know, I'm not uh, myself an expert in medical matter, but, you know, from the outside, you know, when we look at Ames, and you, you mentioned that, you have this uh, extreme contrast between, on the one hand, uh, an extreme elitism in the in the selection of the of the doctor and the medical staff you know, one of the most like selective in the world i would imagine it's very it's a high rate of selectivity and on the other hand you have a, a huge i mean i would say democratic access by a large public to the service of the aim which is also quite amazing by any standard so you have this contrast this confrontation between you know the the best doctors who are bound to meet like the most like poor and I would say deprived segment of the of the population, and one would guess that this model could be uh, could be interesting. I mean, it could be interesting from a, a kind of a progressive point of view to bring you know the the, the best medicine to to the poorest uh, people. But uh, from listening to to what you said, you seem to be quite skeptical about this. Model. And I was I mean, so you. The comment you made were elusive, uh, so I, I understand you didn't have a lot of time. So I would would like you perhaps to elaborate on that because obviously India has a lot of uh, other problem. But you know my my gut initial feeling would be that this at least this particular very specific model of you know the con of confronting of bringing together the best doctor with the whole uh, Indian population at almost locus it was a an a priori interesting model, and if it fails. According to you, why did it fail? And I would like to have your view on that. Thank you. Thank you. It's um, yeah, it's a good provocation, and I agree. I, the that con that tension that you describe is really the driving my driving interest in in the institution, and I am in absolute agreement with you that it is can be seen as a progressive, and it is a good thing. That poor people have access to very high quality healthcare, of course, and they should have that everywhere. They shouldn't have to spend many hours on a train to go to this hospital in, in Delhi, obviously. Um, what I am skeptical about is the limited, is are the narrow horizons that are anticipated for the students who train at Ames. So 
very few graduates from Ames can then go and work at Ames. Um, and it's interesting when you talk to them, talk to some of these students about their aspirations and the public versus the private sector, Ames occupies a unique space in that because on the whole, people, students will say, I would love to work in the private sector and go and give back and I have a debt and I want to do, but this is why I can't do that. And it's infrastructure and it's politics and it's money and it's, it's all the things you would expect. And often they say, unless it was Ames, and what they mean crucially these days is Ames Delhi. Um, in that case, they would trade the salary and the how, you know, and they would, because there is such a status and such a prestige that comes with that. What concerns me is that MBBS students at Ames are not encouraged to see themselves as working in other similar settings. What they are encouraged to do is to train at this institute and then go on essentially into private practice that these same patients do not have access to. So that, that's my concern. It's not that there is something wrong here, it's that for the students, the vision of what these, the kind of education these students have and the kind of medicine they can go on to provide is not a kind of medicine to remedy the situation that we see at Ames with all these hundreds of thousands of people arriving. What it is, is to go off and be a very well respected famous doctor in a private clinic in a city somewhere, quite often outside of India. And what I would like to see is just in a simple sense, a greater acknowledgement of more varied futures, more varied potential other potential models of, of medical provision um, that don't depend on reproducing aims because that's not the answer. So thank you for the question and for, for attending, I appreciate it. Uh, we, we have a, we have a, a question uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Ramesh Babu in the, in the chat box, which I will, uh, I will uh, read to the audience and then I will allow myself to, to additional uh, uh, burning questions I, I, I have for you, Anna. Um, so so, so um, Dr. Ramesh Babu is asking you if you could throw some uh, uh, light on the socioeconomic transformation of, of uh, Dalit doctors. Um, and to, to add to, to, to add uh, um, on, on that, um, I have um, yeah, I have two 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 questions uh, for you. The first the first one is a little bit like related to to what we're seeing these days about a, an emer the emergence of a, of a certain tension between so called allopathic medicine and uh, alternative form of, uh, of medicine. And if we take it in a Foucaultian sense, this, this idea of how modern medicine became, became modern medicine by uh, 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 smashing or like annihilating alternative forms of so-called medical knowledge. What we, could, what we can see uh, in, the, in, the, in, in, the current, in the current phase is that uh, uh, a certain blurring of this, this distinction with like, uh, the health, the, the health minister Ashwardan going to uh, uh, um, even by uh, to, to to launch coronil, which is a Ayurvedic uh, uh, medicine. And is there is there a tension between um, uh, this uh, so-called allopathic medicine and um, this kind of Vedic medicine that now is trendy and everyone talks about? And how is Ames trying to counter? Uh, um, a certain kind of progressive like distrust in many sections in many sections among among the poor and in particular in rural areas for uh, uh, um, for uh, so-called western western form of of medicine and the second question is related to the to to of course to this this privatization of uh, of um Health and health systems in India, um, which you know, as you know, has reached absolutely like dramatic, dramatic levels. How how are your respondents like? How are the the, the people you follow like reacting to 
this absolute this absolute like withdrawal of public medicine uh, in 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 India, um, and as you said, they, they might they might be waiting to move to a to, to a private clinic uh, once they have the diploma. But is there also a sense of defense of the public of the public institution and the need of making medicine more more accessible or or they or no or not it's just the the feeling that because the privilege is given to them better they maximize it and and go to the and go to the us or go to work in 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 uh, in a private clinic and if yes how does that interact with this, this entire nationalistic idea and ideals that was like the Nehruvian one, and of course has been since then dismantled, but of course cannot be completely, completely forgotten. So, is it are some people there in the institution to to try to defend it or or to promote it? Thanks, JT, and thank you, Ramesh. Um, it's a it's a really it's a theme that I would really love to do some more work on. I can't say much about it. In fact, I say in the book that because, as I said at the beginning, by choosing this, I don't know if, I mean, breadth over depth, I hope it's not quite as shallow as that makes it sound. But, you know, I have one chapter that really goes into depth about caste and reservation and affirmative action on campus. And had I designed the project with that as my main focus, that would have been the book and it could have been the book and it should be a book. I mean, we need a lot more books about how the lit students experience higher education, I think, um, beyond what we already know. Um, I, I became interested in the career aspirations of some of the students. Um, some Dalit students and I was aware that there were the people who I spoke to who were particularly interested in the polit the grassroots politics of health were SC and ST students but I did not do enough work on that to be able to say I really have something to say about this either um, similarly I do have some material in the book about how to one particular student in in the ST category talks about his transformation um, and he doesn't put it in socioeconomic terms he puts it in terms of his his self and his personality and I do have some work around that what it means to and another student talks about transforming her personality for the better and I link that to this talk about this middle class kind of habitus and English and how people comport themselves and how they appear to others. And there is potential for a, a lot more work there. Um, but at this point, I can I can only say that I I approach these themes, but I don't address them in in the kind of depth that that they deserve. And I and I hope that. Partly what I hope for this book is that if it does anything, it perhaps opens some doors for some new conversations and provokes some people to go off and pick up certain themes and, and do work in, in greater depth. Thank you very much for the, for the question. JT, um, biomedical indigenous Ayurvedic tension, I... It's not, a it's not in the book, it's not a theme in the book. Where this comes up in the book is um, around the establishment of Ames um, and Nehru's perspective and his, his kind of, his ambivalence around which kind of medical systems, him wanting to really push biomedicine and Western standards of science, but also not wanting to jettison indigenous systems and this tension between them, how do we espouse both? Um, but in terms of contemporary experiences of that, I can't say that I know anything about Ames addressing that distrust. And what is unique about Ames that it is that it is one of the public institutions that people do trust. 
people do generally trust the doctor's aims and people do say that they talk better than a lot of other public sector doctors, not across the board, but in general, the patients that I spoke to would generally say that we know that they're busy and overworked, but on the whole, we have a better experience here than we do elsewhere. Um, so I'll leave that one for now because it's it's not really my, my area, um, but it's that doesn't mean it's not an interesting question. Private sector, public sector is a, a big conversation. Um, and I do have quite a lot on this in the book when it comes to students' aspirations. Um, and to keep it brief, no, students do not in general um, say, they don't give the impression that the public sector is over in terms of medicine or that it's not relevant to them. A lot of the students I spoke to were very conscious of the value of aims of, they were very conscious of how subsidized their education was, of feeling that they wanted to give something back um, and of a lot of the complexities and the issues around the politics of public health care and the fact that it's neglected, that it's underfunded, that it's never on the political agenda. That's all present. When it comes to the practicalities of how do I want to practice medicine, then yes, it becomes, well, I would like to give back, I would like to contribute through the public sector, but that's just not practical. Um, and in some cases that is true. And in other cases, yes, there's a narrative that works as a bit of a, a disguise for, for other intentions. Um, but I do, I do go into this in, in more depth. And also to make the point that I think particularly in the global north, we have a more, um, we have a clearer dichotomy when it comes to public and private healthcare. And in India, healthcare has always been private in India. That's, that's one point to make. It's not that there's been a fall from this, you know, system that was all this well-funded public provision. You know, there was a time when there was a push for that, but there's always been private medicine people have always gone to private doctors it doesn't mean they've always gone to five star super speciality corporate hospitals but they've always paid you know some rupees to the local doctor and so there there is more of a a hybrid um i don't think it's a model but existence of of healthcare in india and yes of course what we're seeing is an explosion of of the corporate side of that um, and I think that's becoming quite naturalized. So for a lot of students, they've grown up with that. They haven't seen that much of a change, actually. Um, but that doesn't mean that they view it all uncritically. Um, I think you would, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we'll take quickly two last questions, if uh, Anna, you're, you're fine with this. Uh, so that we can we can we can we can wrap it up quickly. So, um, Lakshmi and Aparajita, would you would you like to uh, ask your question, uh, if possible, briefly? Um, sure. Um, if Lakshmi wants to go first, it's fine. Um, that's okay. Uh, okay. Thanks, Aparajita. Um, thank you, Anna, for this talk. Um, I just wanted to ask. I want to move away from this picture that you have um, laid out, and I want to ask about beyond this in your conversations with these trainee students did you get a sense of cracks in this the way in which this institution is formatting these trainee doctors with erasures of issues of social inequality erasures of questions of politics did you get a sense of any cracks in this from your conversations with students where it may be minor, but it cannot be that the students are unaware of their location in the capital city, um, facing conflict with administration, administrations, uh, with the, the, the hospital administration, um, patient conflicts, political protests. These things are happening around them. Did you get a sense of any kinds of minor stories that are possibly resisting this formation of these kinds of trainee doctors. Thanks. 
JT, shall I go ahead with that one or do you want to? You're on mute. Do you want me to go ahead? Do you, you're sure, on mute. The project, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm just going to, um, yeah. Um, yeah, um, I just want you to, uh, it was a very fascinating discussion. So it, please tell me when you want to like shut off and say this is it. Um, just go on, going on the concept of coasters and the, and the idea that the Institute itself is coasting. Um, if you could just elaborate more on that. Thanks. That was very concise. Thank you. Also, it's very nice to see you. Um, Lakshmi, thank you. You're right, of course. Um, it's, I have a nice, um, at the beginning of one of the chapters, I have two nice quotes, and they're from the same student, from the same interview. And the first one says, Ames is an island. People don't relate to the outer world or the world outside here. And the second one, which is from the same conversation, says, Ames is part of the society. How can it not be affected by everything that goes on? So which I love as this really neat encapsulation of the fact that students at Ames are simultaneously part of this bubble. And of course, it's a bubble that is permeated by all the social currents going on outside and everything that they bring with them. So it's, I really don't want to give the impression that this is a bunch of, you know, kind of either that people arrive as blank slates because they don't, or that it's some kind of bunch of automatons or robots that are being constructed through this form of education. No. Um, some of the students I talked to, yes, were, were engaged, were politically engaged. Um, there is one particular faculty member who is not popular within the faculty, but very popular with a lot of the students because he's one of the few people who does an extracurricular conversation around the grassroots politics of health and really tries to turn students on to this way of thinking. Um, it's a bit, it's similar in a way to the point about the social sciences, you know, it's not that no one on the Ames campus is, is reading anything other than mugging up a textbook. Of course, these are all, you know, a lot of these young people are bright, interesting individuals. It's just that that's not the culture of the institute that they're in, and it's not encouraged by the institute. Um, and there's a way in which the institute for MBBS students, and actually, a project, I'll link this onto your question. The institute, the general sense from students at the institute is that it doesn't really care about MBBS students, um, that it coasts on this reputation, that it's such, you know, the absurdity of the admissions process is such that virtually everyone is going to pass with 50% with no intervention from the institution. They have made attendance at lectures compulsory, which it didn't, which it didn't used to be. Um, but that's not, so when it comes to the institution as coasting, yes, there's a question about if you have 200,000 people applying for 100 places each year, where is your incentive to to change coming from um, and for as long as that sustains your reputation where will where will the will to transformation come from um, and so what i mean by coasting is that that these mbbs students kind of just get churned out without a great deal of attention and a lot of the students i spoke to were disappointed and surprised by given the given the place in the imagination of this institute, they arrive and a lot of them were disappointed by the lack of attention by teachers, the lack of interesting kind of pedagogical innovation um, and the feeling that they were just left to get on with it and mug up their exams and then they'd pass and off they go with this stamp that you are an Amesonian um, and you're expected to do certain things. Um, and there have been some introductions, there is a, there is a crest program which had just begun when i was there so I, I i wasn't really involved with it but there's a program that is intended to set students up with faculty faculty mentors at the start of the course and to lend a bit more of that pastoral dimension so that students who need more support can get more support 
but at that point I was told by a lot of students that they would go to register at the start of the semester they'd go home for the two weeks of that crest course and then they'd go back again to to start their course so that's briefly what I what I mean by by coasting but there's obviously a lot more to say thanks thanks Anna um, thank you, Anna, for providing so much detail, uh, information and answers to, 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 to all the participants. This is really, really kind of you. Um, there's a, uh, there's a uh, question from uh, Kirti Nakre, but if, uh, apologies, but if, if Anna feels like having a, a direct conversation with you, um, after after the seminar that uh, that uh, that would be that would be amazing um i would like to 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 thank you anna for once again for for this uh, first and um, milestone uh, uh, um, presentation on your on your very exciting book which i'm sure everyone will buy with the discount with the discount of course and um, um, I, I apologies for, for, for running uh, um, a little bit over time, but considering the, the, the density of the conversation and the, the richness of it, I think it was completely um, worth it. So uh, um, without further waiting, I would like to, to uh, bring this, uh, this amazing session to, to a close and invite, uh, uh, invite all of you for our last session of the of the of the year uh, in uh, in two weeks times, uh, in which we will have a, a Christoph Andres that will talk about education, an alternative form of education in India. Um, thank you, Anna. Um, thank you all the the participants, and uh, I, I hope everyone will have a a, a great a great week. Thanks so much, JT, and thank you everybody. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.